Good morning. I am Wayworn Worm, and welcome to my channel. And welcome back to The Stolen Land. Today we are on episode 17, The Beginning of the End. Lucian, Petra, Tiber, and Umbria found themselves sitting on one side of the main table at Oleg's inside the main trading post. On the side to their left sat Oleg and Svetlana. On the side to their right sat Keston. On the opposite side of the table sat a minor sword lord and several soldiers. On the table next to him sat a rather large bag of money. The party was feeling as if this was all a bit surreal, sitting here all of a sudden, mud still dripping from their boots minutes after they arrived to the safety of the trading post. Finally, the sword lord began. Word of your exploits has started to reach rest of. We are impressed, to say the least. So far, you have managed to do more than we had hoped. He pushed the bag, clearly filled with coins by the sound, across the table to Lucian. We had two open contracts for the green belt, but it does not appear that Oleg had been given copies of them. Either way, you have completed them, and this is the stated reward. The first contract is to show the bandits of the area that their actions will not be tolerated, nor will they go unanswered. Keston's reports, at this he gestured to Keston, talk about how many bandits you've encountered and dispatched. It is believed that, at least in the northern and eastern areas of the Green Belt, you've crippled the activities of the bandits, and therefore we consider that contract fulfilled. The second contract was to either slay or forge an alliance with the Sootscale Cobalts. The goal with this contract was to remove the Cobalts as enemies, and it never mattered much which way it ended up being. We have heard reports of your alliance with them, and as such, consider that contract also complete. As such, we owe you 1,200 gold pieces. This bag contains that much gold, and as such, we consider our debts to you paid in full for completing these contracts. The party looked at each other in surprise and even some bewilderment. This was by far the most support the Eldori Sword Lords had given their expedition, and that much gold would have to be put down in some sort of official ledger, making it also the most public display of support. With this, it would be crystal clear to anyone who bothered to look that the Eldori Sword Lords were actively backing expeditions all across the so Stolen Lands with the express goal of, of creating political entities. Things started sliding into place in Lucian's head, and the situation was changing, and he knew he would have to talk to the group about it later. Now was certainly not the time nor the place. The situation then even more drastically changed. So far, all of this has not required the presence of a sword lord. We could have sent anyone, but an official sword lord is needed for the next part. We are offering you one last contract. Find the stag lord and kill him. Bring back his head as proof of demise. That is the contract. The reward is this. He pulled out a scroll and with a flourish opened it up and laid it on the table fa facing Lucian. It read, Be it so known that the bearers of this charter, having delivered the northeastern reaches of the green belt from the scourge of banditry, having provided detailed maps of the lay of the land, and having done no small amount of work in the exploration of said land and the culling of hostile monsters and indigenous hazards, are hereby granted the right to rule. The nature and laws of rule are theirs to define, and the well-being of this new nation is theirs to protect. In accordance for prov the providing of a safe nation south of central Westland, let there be a generous stipend of funds, support, and advice provided to this fledgling, fledgling nation as a token of Restov and Brevois goodwill, such that future relations between kingdoms may be mutually beneficial. 
so witnessed under the watchful eye of the lordship of Restov, and by the authority granted by Lord Nerliski Sertova, current regent of the Dragonscale throne. Lucian's eyes got bigger and bigger as he read the charter. Finally, he looked up, meeting the expectant gaze of the sword lord. And all we have to do for you to provide us this charter is kill the stag lord? The sword lord smiled at him. Almost. I arrived a few days ago, and Oleg and Keston have been filling me in on your expeditions into the Green Belt. My understanding is that, by now, you would have mapped everything northeast of the Shrike River, at least from the point where the Thorn River meets the Shrike, as well as everything east of the Thorn River, as well as the section of your original charter north of the Gnarl Marches. Tyver nodded at this. Yes, that about sums up what we've explored so far. Good. My understanding is also that the next thing on your list to, is to expand the map in such a way that instead of mapping everything east of the Thorn River, you want to have everything east of the Skunk River mapped. This time, Lucian spoke up. Yes, at least up until we reached here and began this meeting. With that charter as reward for killing the Stag Lord, we might rearrange our plans a bit. No, please don't. We would like you to finish mapping everything east of the Skunk River. Do you know where the Stag Lord's elusive fort is? No, but we have an idea. We believe that it is somewhere in the couple of miles between where the Skunk River meets the Tuskwater and where the Shrike River le uh, leaves the Tuskwater. Not only is that the only place that really makes sense, but at this point, it is really the only place left that it wouldn't be crazy to have such a fort as we understand that he has that we have not mapped. We also had an encounter just a couple of days ago that further points to his fort being along the Shrike River. And we've mapped almost all of that river, except for the first few miles as it leaves the Tuskwater. The Sword Lord nodded. From the beginning, we figured it was probably somewhere around there. Although some had wondered if it was on that island in the Candlemere. There's rumor to be some sort of tower there. And, as with all abandoned towers, a mad mage of some kind is supposed to have dwelled there. Probably even built it. Well, I think that is enough for now. However, I would like to speak with Lucian alone. Would that be alright? The Sword Lord asked while looking at each member on all three other sides from them. After a few seconds, Oleg hastily stood up as he was unaccustomed to being asked to leave his own house. Um, yes, yes, that, that should be fine. He pointedly looked at the other members of the Volsal expedition, then to Keston, and finally to his wife. Shouldn't it? Everyone nodded in agreement and left, closing the door behind them. The Sword Lord sat there, waiting as their people also left with the rest, and then waited a few seconds more after the door closed to give everyone time to move away from the door. Finally, they began. There is one more piece of business that we must attend to that requires a sword lord to come in person. In fact, it is the reason why I am here. The contract and the charter could have been offered by a member of the Rostov government. However, this piece of business requires a sword lord. And since I could do all the other business we needed with your expedition, it was decided that I come. Lucian Vosal. It has come to our attention that you wish to join our organization. We have known this for a while. In fact, it is part of the reason why you were picked to lead this small expedition. Lucian nodded a bit apprehensively at this, fearing that he was stepping into some sort of trap. What you have done here is certainly more than enough to prove that you would make an excellent addition to our group. I do hope you understand that we cannot offer you a place in the Sword Lords. Your expedition was part of our plan of plausible deniability, if anyone questioned how openly we were trying to create nations here in the Stolen Lands. We had hoped that your group would have done the job well, but not too well, and upon it returning to us with the maps, we would have made them publicly accessible. The hope was that then one group would have taken care of the soot scales, and one or two groups would have taken care of the bandits and killed the Stag Lord. 
Then, with much hand-wringing, we would have gone to Lord Noleski Sertova and planted the seed of an idea that the only way to control this possibly new rogue nation would have been to provide a charter and then donate much to help them grow. However, for better or for worse, you have done a better job than we could have imagined, and with such a small company. It was decided that the only course of action was to offer this charter once you had removed the only person who had a decent claim on the green belt. Because of how well you have done, and some shifting politics in Brevoy, we will be fairly openly supporting your expedition as you found this nation. And since you are the same group that we, have, that we gave the first charter to, at the same time as the more official expeditions set out, people will suspect, and not completely incorrectly I might add, that this was our goal from the beginning. Adding you to the ranks of the Sword Lords would be seen as giving a much clearer endorsement, as well as a land grab, if we were to make you a baron and then have you join our group. Lucian took a moment to absorb all of this information. His breath caught in his chest for a second before it freed itself. Here he was, 21 years old, having wanting, wanted to join the Sword Lords for as long as he could remember, and being told in no uncertain terms, that he would not be able to. And the reason that he would not be able to join the ranks of the Sword Lords is because he was too good at what he was doing to try and impress them. It was a very bitter pill to swallow, to say the least. Okay, I understand. We were just talking about this rather tangled political situation a few nights ago. It sounds very delicate. That is an understatement. Now, while the Charter clearly speaks very strongly of helping you, at least at first, we'll be fairly limited in what we can actually do. We'll make sure we provide you enough that you won't fail or anything dramatic like that. However, the road between Olegs and Restov won't suddenly be filled with caravans stretching the whole length of the road, filled with gold, people, and building supplies. We will help as we can. You will be an important ally in the future. Lucian nodded. Understood. Now, if you will excuse me, I have much to discuss with my party before we move on to our fourth expedition. The Sword Lord nodded their assent, and Lucian got up and walked out of Oleg's. The party discussed the changing landscape that long into that night. They had much to process as they were getting the legitimacy that they wanted and had strived so long to get. But that came at a price. Or at least, they were sure it would. The more openly the Sword Lords acted in the Stolen Lands, the more it would antagonize Issia, bringing the two nations ever closer to civil war. But on the other hand, the closer the two factions got towards civil war, the more Openly, the Sword Lords would have to act right now if they wanted any hope of having the allies they were trying to set up ready to help. No matter how they felt about it, they were on the same side as the Sword Lords. Eventually, the talk moved to the upcoming expedition. This is going to be our longest yet. It will take us at least 17 days, and that is assuming we spend no more than a day at the Stag Lord's Fort. We should, we should prepare for three weeks of being away. I know this will bring us to the edge of what we can carry, but that is why we have horses. We'll remain here for a few days so Umbria can copy over the spells she needs, and then we'll be off. Several days later, they made good on their goals and started off back into the wilderness. It would take them three days just to get to the bridge that they were aiming for. They spent both the time at Oleg's and on their way to the edge of where they had mapped deep in thought. They had been mapping for the better part of a year now, and up to a few days ago, nothing much had seemed to change. Now, all of a sudden, things were quickly moving toward their conclusion. Three more weeks, and they'd be the leaders of a new nation. Luckily for them, the trip to the crossing where they had defeated the bandits so long ago was uneventful. From then, it would be mapping the rest of the Narl Marches, 
than the small amount of flat land between the Skunk and Thorn rivers. The next day, as they were exploring the next part of the Gnarl Marches, a dense mix of marsh and forest and hills, they suddenly came into a clearing next to a hill. The clearing was in the shape of two circles that slightly overlapped, causing the forest to pinch in at the middle from about 180 feet at its widest point to 70 feet in the middle. The part of the clearing the group first entered looked like a normal glade, if on the large side, but the second circle, the one that butted up to the hill, was much different. Ringing the outside of the circle were several stone pillars that were quite old and beginning to fall apart. One or two of them had already collapsed. The entire part of that clearing was covered in a worked stone floor that was beginning to break apart, showing the ground underneath in a few places. In the middle of the stone floor was a large pool that was filled with what appeared to be stagnant water covered in a thick film of algae. The far end of the clearing had a massive, wide, a massively wide st stone staircase that rose ten feet to a raised platform that provided the entrance to a cave. But the most striking feature in the entire site was the fact that the hill was carved into the likeness of a giant elk, one hundred feet tall and three hundred feet wide. In its prime, this site must have been extraordinary. But the elk and the stairs were covered in moss, and the middle of the staircase was completely destroyed. The expedition walked toward it slowly, due both to the awe that they felt at finding this grand sight and the words of the priest Jihad, who had asked them to look out for lost temples to Arastil, guarded by angry bears. Tiber looked at the area ahead of them and pointed to the elk carving. I don't think this needs to be said but this was clearly a shrine to Arastil at some point. Depending on how much of the hill is carved out, it might even be a full-on temple in there. Lucian looked over the site as the group continued their approach. <clears throat> how old do you think it is? Tiber shrugged. I can't rightly say for sure. I'd imagine something like this must have been built when the 5th Army of Exploration came through the area in the early... 2000s AR, so about 2,700 years. So all told, this has probably been abandoned for roughly 2,000 years. As he said this, the group passed through the circle of pillars and into the shrine itself. The place felt oppressive, old, and ruined, maybe even scorned by Arastil. The place did not feel evil, but more like the anger of a good god. They approached the pool in the middle of the open space before the steps and heard the roar of an angry bear that rushed out from the shrine. Tiber was the first to react, pulling out his crossbow. He knelt to fire, but did not track the bear charging down the stairs properly and watched as the bolt flew harmlessly over the bear. Umbria shot a scorching ray at the bear, hitting it solidly in the back. Petra pulled out her short bow and fired as the bear crossed half the distance between them and the shrine. The arrow pierced the bear, but it seemed to almost shrug it off. Lucian pulled back with his longbow and let fire, embedding the arrow deep into the bear's shoulder. The bear was in a rage by this point, but was close enough that Tiber dropped his crossbow, pulled out his scimitar, and charged the bear, slashing it deeply before sliding out of the way. Umbria shot another scorching ray into the bear again, ending it. As it collapsed to the ground, it let out a sigh of relief that sounded almost human. Then before their eyes, it, transfor it transformed into an incredibly old human with a look of peace in his eyes before crumbling first into a skeleton, then to dust. As that happened, everything around seemed to become more colorful and vibrant, and the pool became crystal clear, all of the algae disappearing. Tiber looked up at the sky. Well, I believe we've sanctified this place. That is a good bet, 
Abria replied, before the group set off again. As much as they would have liked to have stayed, they had things that needed to be done. The next day, they found themselves on the Skunk River, mapping its headwaters. Situated between two of the streams that merged to become the Skunk River, they came across a rather foul-smelling set of hot springs. Relaxing in the hot springs were two giant frogs that were quickly dispatched in a way not worth recording. It was decided that they would move on quickly, primarily due to the sulfuric smell emanating from the hot springs. Another reason for their quick departure was knowing that they would be mapping along the Skunk River for several days. They were not quite sure how many days, as no one had a great idea of how the Skunk River traveled through the Gnarl Marches, but they knew roughly where it left the Gnarl Marches, just before Tuskwater Lake, near where they believed the Stag Lord resided. The next day, they crossed through a marsh with two sunken buildings, when a humanoid frog creature came out. Everyone immediately adopted a defensive position with hands and weapons, but no one pulled out a weapon before the creature croaked out, Drews! Drews! Holding up both of its hands, one of which was a mangled mess. Lucian stepped forward. Who are you? Me, Boggard, the creature, presumably a Boggard, said. Tiber thought for a second. Hold on, he said quickly before casting a spell. Speak, please. The bogger looked at Tiber, speaking in its language. I am Gurum. I do not speak much of your language. Tiber smiled and nodded. More. I don't understand what you're saying. But you seem to understand me. No, I was exiled. From the hooked on slow many years ago, and am now the king of this kingdom. I do not wish to harm you, and you appear do not wish to harm me. If you truly mean me no harm, you will go now without. We're rossing through my swamp. If you can figure out how to speak with me, come back and we can talk. Tyra nodded as he comprehended as he could comprehend any language at the moment, but unfortunately the spell did not work the other way. The Boggart says his name is Gorum, and he is the king of this kingdom. He does not wish to hurt us, and if we mean the same, we will leave without crossing through his kingdom. Although we are free to come back if we can figure out how to communicate with him. Lucian nodded and led the expedition around the swamp, leaving that small area poorly mapped. They continued moving down the Skunk River, mapping about as slowly as they had the entire time they had been mapping. Thank you so much for listening to The Solo Lands, episode 17. I hope you enjoyed the uh, Boggart speaking as much as I enjoyed doing that voice. I thought it was a really fun voice. Uh, so make sure you tune in next time for episode 18, Tetzel Worms and Tusk Gutter, The End of the Gnarl Marches. And also... I am doing a playthrough of Battle Brothers. You should have seen the first episode by now, and the second one will be up a week after the first. Thank you so much.